So um, what I want to talk about today is this whole project of the euphonopen. And I tend to think of the euphonopen more of a meditation on drawing. So when we're talking about research and all this, it's more thinking about drawing that uh, the, the whole project is about. And it's been something that I've been doing, drawing, since I was very little. But thinking about it as something we all do has started fairly recently, in the last 10 years. So um, again, um, what I'm trying to, to explore is what drawing tells us and how it tells us. And uh, I want to introduce the team we're working with, Anne-Marie, who's been great. Uh, a lot of these things uh, would not have happened with her. Klaus Engel, who is kind of the maker of this pro project. I uh, kind of have the ideas and Klaus makes them and uh, Anne-Marie makes them reality. Miles Thorogood helped us in a very crucial phase of the, the project. Uh, to do the programming, and we have a very talented musician who was an intern, um, Edward Cho, who is a cellist uh, and a pianist, a first class musician, but who also has had uh, three years of robotics um, under his belt, so when he came to this project, he brought a lot of expertise that we, we could use. Um, our, the organization we're working with is Interarts Matrix. It has a wonderful website that uh, Nathan, our videographer, uh, has put together recently. Uh, please go and visit it. There's, I'm, our project is one of many, and uh, there are many wonderful projects that Interarts Matrix has undertaken. And of course, our supporters. Without further ado, let's talk a little bit about drawing. So, um, what is drawing? Drawing is something that's very existent in, in every aspect of our lives. As a matter of fact, as soon as you pick up something that's made by humans, it probably started work as a drawing. So, um, in its very basic uh, state, it's making marks with an instrument. And I put this uh, in brackets because that, uh, the instrument can be kind of optional. You can draw with light. Um, you can draw with your hands, which are not an instrument, but uh, generally on a surface. So um, as I said, everything that uh, a lot of things that is ma uh, that are, uh, the things that are man-made start off as drawings. So like this, uh, or like the cube, the Royal Ontario Museum cube that started off as a drawing on the back of a serviette. What people don't think about is that the serviette started off as a drawing too. Um, so this is a drawing too, uh, something we're quite familiar. In. What we don't think of is that the writing on the drawing is a drawing. Writing is a subset of drawing. Um, this is a drawing. This is a drawing. And some other kinds of drawing. Uh, uh, people have drawn animals for thousands of years. And this is Leonardo's uh, experiments with some cats. And this is something anybody who draws loves and hates to draw. <laughs> uh, also Leonardo. Uh, hands are very important in drawing. That, that's what we mostly draw with, although we can draw, make snow angels in the snow, which is a form of drawing. We can draw with our feet as we leave tracks. But um, hands are very important. So I'm going to open a bracket here, because in fact, the Euphonopen project comes from a previous project that is still ongoing. And uh, the, the Euphonopen was sort of a a detour that we're coming back to. So the, um, the project that we were doing was investigating drawing gestures. And it came out of my experience of teaching and my experience of looking at drawings. Now, when you go in a gallery, I go and go very close to drawings, and I study them at length. What you see a lot of people doing is they go and read the label, spend 
two seconds and move on. So I was trying to think about ways of really engaging people with drawing in the way I'm engaged. Somebody said, I don't know what I think before I speak or before I write. Well, I sometimes don't know what I see until I draw it. So drawing is a way of actually slowing your your vision down in order to see more clearly, in order to actually spend some time with the subject. So um, if you look, for example, at this uh, poster, if you look at the hand, I said, uh, what is this hand doing? It's, it's holding a pen. It could be writing. It could be drawing. So it was that gesture that, that I wanted to communicate to the people who look at drawings. Now. Um, Look at this gesture, and look at the gesture of the, the small boy in this picture. It's the same gesture, but for a different purpose. So in this particular one, it's for writing. In here, if you look at the gesture, it's, he's just spun the top, and he's getting ready to spin it again. So it is this kind of gesture that can actually have a resonance in us. Uh, we draw on our own memory of what it is to make that particular movement. And um, there's a term for this. It's called kinetic resonance. So if somebody even describes a gesture, we kind of know we draw on something. And um, it's this business of hands. You know how these hands have been made. It was a certain type of pictorial motion. Each one of you, when you see that, you can almost feel it in your palms. You also know how this was made, which was a different kind of motion. So it's, I started thinking very much about this kind of process. And what really brought it in focus to me was this. This is something that I've been practicing for some 10 years now, Shodo, Oriental Calligraphy. And this is um, my uh, teacher with whom I'm still studying to this day, making the character for Dragon. 2012 was the year of the dragon. So with this character, unlike the, the prints of the hands or around the hands, it's a little bit harder to feel in your body what it feels like to make this kind of character. So um, when I'm describing something to you, I'm drawing on this kinetic res resonance. When you actually feel it, what you're doing is, is actually using your kinetic empathy. You're drawing on your own experience, your own memories, to be able to reproduce that movement in your own body. In Oriental calligraphy, unlike the teaching that we do of drawing in general in, in the West, they actually believe very much in repetition, in pattern, and in actually teaching this kind of body memory. So here's the same character of the dragon done again. So what I want to talk about is 
that the touch of this teacher goes back to the touch of her teacher and to the touch of his teacher and that in fact there is a lineage of teaching that goes back hundreds of years through this, this kind of touch. So the project that I undertook with Klaus is called the lineage machine. What we were what we are trying to do is actually a robotic arm that will reproduce the drawing movement, right? So we're looking at this kind of body molding and trying to transmit that kind of body memory so that when somebody looks at drawing, they will draw on the kind of experience that I have drawing. And they will spend the time trying to understand this. Now, body molding is something that's not only common to calligraphy, but it's actually very common in dance. And it is with this thinking about body molding in dance that made the jump to the Euphonopen project. Because in dance, of course, what you have is music. And in fact, music also draws very much on your kinetic empathy. So it was from this. So I'll uh, close my bracket now. And uh, as a detour of the lineage machine, we had the euphono pen, which is uh, an instrument to generate and manipulate sound for a drawing performance. Because in a drawing performance, already you see somebody doing something because you hear it. It actually resonates in your body in a certain, certain way. So. We started to investigate what does drawing really sound like and what it is. So now drawing, when we see it, we see a location of the mark, the pressure of the mark, the curvature, the length. We make some uh, supposition about the entry, the attack of the mark, the speed. We don't know for sure but uh, when we look at the drawing, and how, how the, the mark exits. So those are things that we can actually see in a finished drawing. If we think of drawing as a performance, what you see in a, in a very certain way is the order of marks, the pause between marks. We, we, if you look at the, at the finished drawing, you'll never ever find those kind of, let's call them silences in the drawing. Uh, for sure, you'll see the entry, the speed, the pause within the mark. As you saw in the dragon, there was, you just stopped there and thought before you actually took the, the mark else, elsewhere. The variations in speed, the exit, the hesitations, and of course, the sound of drawing. Uh, you could hear the brush going as, uh, as the dragon was being dragon character was being made. So uh, we spent, I spent uh, quite a bit of time thinking about what does drawing sound like. And one of the places where I first heard, thought about it, is this marvelous, marvelous movie. It's a classic, um, The Mystery of, Mystery of Picasso. Now listen what this drawing sounds like. It sounds like you actually know what instrument he's using. You know he's using the marker, right? So we're making a very characteristic uh, uh, sound. So um, in its very basic way, depending on what kind of instrument you use, it makes a certain kind of mark. And there have been a number of musical pieces um, that actually drew on that, uh, that kind of uh, sound. Uh, one of them that I saw actually at open years a few years ago, I think in 2001 or something like that, um, was uh, this particular piece. It was performed by Tony Urquhart, 
who taught some of us here. <laughs> and uh, he performed it uh, with the Penderecki Quartet at the time. And um, it was uh, something that was quite wonderful. It was uh, something at the back of my mind. Now, um, here is a fragment from the same Picasso movie with m music added afterwards. about this music is how it actually engages with the subject. And in fact, what it does, it dramatizes the drawing, right? It, it almost adds a, a voiceover, a narration to the drawing. It wasn't this kind of thing that I was really after. What I was after was actually the drawing making what they call a musical gesture. In other words, a gesture that really creates sound rather than dramatizes the drawing. We shall come back to this because sound really changes the meaning, meaning of images. They, they work together in a very, very close way. You cannot really divorce them. But it's an interesting distinction to make between dramatizing music and, and sound gesture. So, this is the kind of thing we're in the euphonium pen we're uh, working with, trying to go from a mark to a sound, from a drawing gesture to a music gesture. So drawing, the evolution of marks in time, to music, the evolution of sound in time, as somebody defined it. And there have been uh, some other projects, early, early project by uh, Yanis Xenakis, who actually used drawing to compose music. So um, since then, there have been a number of instruments where drawing was used to actually kind of bypass the process of notation and to generate music. But that's not exactly what I was after either. There's, there's lots of uh, instruments for the performance of music. What I was after was um, more something like this. Yes, so that was David Rockaby with his project, uh, Very Nervous System, amazing project done in the early days of computing when computers were primitive, uh, where he is actually generating sound by moving his body. In other words, he's making his body, the, the, he's making gesture with his body and the environment responds. So it was in that general area that I was working at. So um, that point, went and uh, saw some people at McGill where they have a lab for um, creating instruments. And they introduced me to this um, project and this man, Mark Zedal. And uh, he was doing a thesis on a uh, kind of electronic instrument whereby he would actually um, use drawing to generate, to actually capture music live and allow a performer um, who is an instrumentalist to catch certain beats and process the music. Um, I took his instrument and totally misused it. I took his instrument and I didn't care where the sound was there. The sound was with it. I just cared to make a drawing. And that's what 
how how it turned out. are meant to actually create uh, certain sound loops and a certain beat, uh, but all this became totally in incidental. What was uh, interesting is what the drawing, the, the very process of drawing, the kind of sound, the way it uh, manipulated that particular sound. Um, so we, uh, I started uh, thinking about this and articulated certain principle that the, the sound is incidental. In other words, the main purpose is to make to a drawing. So the technical name for it is, this is aleatory sound, sound that happens to be to result out of the activity. The sound is a means of guiding your attention, going back to this idea of the, the kinetic uh, resonance, a kinetic, a kinetic resonance on my trying to steal that in you and kinetic empathy on the part of you as public. And together, they'll give you a synesthetic experience in the sense that you're using more than one sense to actually apprehend a work of art, let's say. So our proof of concept, uh, was this, does the sound generated by a drawing make sense? Well, um, what we did, we actually took and hooked up a piano kind of a MIDI thing to, to a drawing, and as you drew it, you made little piano notes, and what it ended up sounded like is this, uh, this uh, program that perhaps some of you saw as a kid, um, and it was very much like this. So it made a certain kind of sense, but it was very primitive, right? So I uh, thought about this some more and uh, started uh, really getting down the nitty gritties and thinking about what a drawing stroke is like. So the thing is that a stroke is made up of one or more drawing gestures. A stroke is complicated. And how do you really translate that into sound? So we, uh, we did and we came up with the, what we call our first version of the phono pen. Um, here are some technical uh, details. And uh, what we did is from the Wacom tablet collected some data and calculated some parameters and we connected those we did the, the differential parameters, the, this, and we connected them to an oscillator. Hmm. Which you're supposed to uh, hear, but you're not. So I shall move on. All right, so um, it did have sound, believe me. It was not very nice. Probably that's exactly why we took it out. <laughs> uh, so the oscillators were actually rather irritating to listen to. So we thought, all right, so uh, th does this make sense? So we went back and asked a number of instrumentalist, and this is where, uh, where um, Anne-Marie was uh, very, very helpful because she got some people who wanted to get him, who actually came and played with us. And uh, 
what they did is actually took the drawing as a graphic score. And then we, again, looked at the drawing as performance. Uh, and uh, making a less of an arbitrary instrument than connecting the drawing to the oscillators. Um, and here is a drawing that's being interpreted by a bass clarinet. We're seeing the animation and she's actually playing along with the drawing. So this, this sound is recorded rather than generated or manipulated. a certain kind of sense. Then uh, we tried some other kind of interpretations. This is a drawing that's interpreted by a singer. <laughs> And the, the layered sound you hear is a cello. So we took the singer and the cello, and they interpreted the drawing at different times, and then we layer them. So even together, they make sense. So the, those were some of the, the kind of investigations we, we made trying to get from the drawing gesture to the musical gesture. So uh, we came up with two requirements we had. So we had to translate from drawing to sound in real time, and we had to have a non-arbitrary mapping of drawing to sound. And um, as a test case, I mean, after quite a bit of searching, we came up with a uh, test case of Giorgio Morandi. Some of you might know him. Uh, those who don't, uh, he was a, a 20th century artist who had a very minimal way of working, both in terms of subject he uh, painted the same set of objects obsessively. And when he drew, he really had a very limited repertoire of drawing gestures. The slow contour, which is kind of the very studied line. The fast contour, which is kind of putting down the position of the object. The parallel hatching in order to create the uh, light and uh, dark. And the zigzag hatching, which uh, you would see in some of his drawings. So this is an instance of this kind of um, fairly slow contour. And this one, also slow contour with some hatching and some fast contour. So uh, it was this particular piece that, uh, that we are looking at. OK, I just, I just want to go back to this. Mm-hmm. 
What you just heard there is entirely came out of the euphonopen. We started off with phrases. We started off with Catherine Ladano, who was really an amazing improviser. That, that's what she does. Uh, rather than somebody who plays from a, a score, she, that's, that's her mode of performing, is improvising. And we worked with her taking, actually disassembling, Morandi's gestures, looking at the slow contour. So she actually, with us, researched and found a theme of for the slow contour. She, we worked together, found a, another theme for the fast contour, a theme for the parallel hatching, one for the zigzag hatching, and we put them all together. So what you saw there was actually just the machine manipulating those sounds. And there are some certain, uh, certain things that we know in the manipulating of sound, you know, low, high, uh, fast, slow, uh, pressure, all those things are, are in there. Uh, what I was amazed is actually that uh, the euphono pen generated sound had so many potentials for mood that even though it was an objective musical gesture and the sound was aleatory, it still dramatized the drawing because it actually, uh, it does um, contain some of the exhilaration of drawing, some of the humor. Um, it can become very lyrical. It become very frantic. So it was, all this was in there, even though the sound was in many ways incidental. The, the logic was making a drawing rather than making music. Music followed the drawing. So um, we created a piece with uh, Catherine Ladano called Objects on the Table. We performed, uh, we found out uh, 12 modules, um, and it's about 45 uh, minutes. So change the number of uh, sound in there, kind of taking the instrument from the sound world of drawing that kind of hissy sound that a uh, pencil makes or a pen down into the sound, into her world, the world of music. And uh, we basically played a duet from the time where she's actually imitating the drawing sound in a very kind of a um, whispery manner to where we are actually playing all out. And for that, you'll have to come and see us. <laughs> Um, but it, it was uh, actually the point where, for us, it was the, the main breakthrough. We, we knew it was going to work then. 
and after doing this, this particular workshop. She, she was absolutely wonderful. And we realized the project had legs. <laughs> um, now, using the Euphora pen is kind of different from people who draw because they're really interested in making marks. Uh, it's, they're really in the logic of the drawing. When we took the Yvonne pen and gave it to other people, especially musicians, they really tried to make sound with it. And a lot of other people, ordinary people who generally don't draw, also tried, uh, they try to find out how it works and exactly where the sound is coming from, which is incidentally is what I found myself at with David Rockaby's uh, piece too. As when I first got into David Rockaby's piece was, all right, so what does this thing do? How, how do I play it? Rather than kind of uh, let the sound be incidental, let the dance become the main thing and the sound follow. So, um, Going back to this idea of, well, how do ordinary people use a euphonic pen? Um, I was trying to find an area where actually people are totally engaged with the graphic mark. And an area where they are is writing. When people write, they'll write no matter what, if their pen is scratchy, if their pen is uh, uh, making awful noises, they'll write because they have to, um, especially if they sign their name. So one of the, the pieces that we're now devising, uh, we workshopped twice and plan to workshop again in November is called Signature. And started off um, as an installation. The idea was to make an installation where the signature would create sound, would generate sound, and would play with people's names. And uh, we're working for this particular piece with composer Nick Nicholas Storing, a local composer who I uh, worked with before for the Notebook project. And he also introduced the idea of bringing in an improvisational choir. So the, the piece started acquiring a whole Meaning. So again, talking about this business of aleatory sound, incidental sound, and dramatizing sound. So it, you cannot get away with it, from it. Pieces that you make have content, and they develop the content in the making. And that kind of content influences the kind of sounds you will play with. So in Signature, we found ourselves playing a lot with people's names, people's voices, uh, looking a lot about where the human voice lives, sort of the spectrum of, uh, of um, frequencies. And it's interesting, research has shown, um, massive research of uh, uh, recordings has shown that the human voice actually kind of clusters frequencies on what we think of the tonal scale. So. This is a, a piece that actually has informed a lot of the euphonopen because uh, it actually taught us how marks and sound go together. The other piece is more similar to objects on the table, but again, it investigates the voice. And it's actually a piece that really, where the content has become so strong that we sometimes think of the piece as a chamber opera. We call it mirror. And the situation is really rather simple. It's something that uh, we who draw kind of encounter every day. It's a person draws another person. I draw a singer. So uh, when we do it as a performance rather than a studio, it becomes really fraught with meaning, especially for the singer, who is usually presenting herself in a certain manner. Um, seeing herself drawn and depicted, uh, it sets up a number of problems. So in some ways, those problems are about her voice, which is being manipulated and reflected, her image, which is being created and reflected back. But for me also, or for the drawing performer, because the singer 
also interprets the drawing. So it's that kind of a mirror between mirrors, which is, by the way, the piece that uh, Arvo Part uh, wrote called Mirror Between Mirrors, um, mirror and mirror. So it's a, it's a reflection of sound into sound. So uh, it's a piece that kind of grew much. We looked at a piece that would be 15, 20 minutes, and we're now looking at a piece that's probably going to be an hour and some. And we're also working with composer. We're working with uh, Ian Crutchley, who is in uh, Edmonton, and uh, with one of his uh, longtime collaborators, whom I met when she came for a concert here. We're also working with Julia Applin, who is a choreographer. She came here all the way from Toronto. She grew up in Cambridge, so we're drawing her back into the arts community here. So she is going to actually look at the kind of movement we make in this particular piece. Uh, we're going to have a, another workshop in August. At the workshops, we usually have a performance, um, if nothing else, so that we can focus and have a goal for the workshop, but also very much so we can get feedback from people who, um, who come to see the piece. So. Um, there's some other ideas in there, but those, those pieces are in the works. Now, Euphonic Pen 2 is in the works too, because those pieces are not only for show. They are for show. We definitely want to, to show what we, we have made, what we have created. The thing is, right now, I actually play the Euphonic Pen. In other words, I choose the gestures manually. So I actually dip my pen into a gesture the way a painter dips his pen, pen uh, his brush in a color. What our research aims to do is actually to build in some kind of gesture recognition where in fact the machine will recognize what gestures I am making and will give me the, the drawing performer, I'm making this for anybody who wants to try it, um, who will actually give the drawing performer the sound. So map that gesture to the corresponding sound. So uh, this is a much bigger uh, research uh, project. And it actually came out of that case study out of um, objects on the table and where we are actually getting close to this. So we want to actually do a number of interpretations of drawing. Then take those drawings apart and divide them into strokes, divide them into gestures, and do quite a bit of statistical analysis. Then take the, that music and play it back, and people actually interpret that music as drawing. And we're actually going at this information from two directions. So it is, to make the analogy with language, is like somewhat like language recognition, um, you, speech recognition. You, you know what it means, you have what it sounds, and you have to find some kind of mapping in between. So we're kind of squeezing that information. If you can imagine graphs, so, so we're kind of squeezing this information between these two sets of inf information and we're actually fitting data, which will result into a machine that will recognize gesture. So this um, particular um, method, mathematical method, comes, is very much used in machine learning nowadays. It's called artificial neural networks, where you make this kind of connections between two sets of data, where you know there's uh, some connection and they exist, separately, but you do not know what the connection is. So uh, this is basically where we are now. And of course, in parallel, we have this project going, the, the lineage machine. Um, there are a number of drawing machines out there, but they draw very much the way nature draws. Um, they're, they're automata, they're, uh, um, 
draw the way you see clouds on the sky or uh, um, the kind of drawing you see on the beach. But machines that actually, a machine that actually teaches you how to draw, well, that's up to us. So um, I'm open to any kind of questions now, and perhaps afterwards you can actually come up and try our machine and try and play with it and make some drawings and make some sound. Um, see if you're more interested in sound or drawing. I see we have quite a few people who draw here, so um, they'll uh, push it a little bit. So uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, and not only for me, as Klaus will also answer some. But I see a hand there, so I'll... Uh... Yes, uh, so in going from the mind of the artist, strokes on the page, to the sound, uh, obviously not all the information is being transferred. Uh, for example, if an artist is drawing something, they know what elements of the drawing they're working on. And that semantic information doesn't appear in the strokes, so it's hard for the software to interpret that. Have you considered giving the artist a palette of sound to choose from? So as they're drawing, they can say, I'd like, you know, an oboe for this next set of strokes, or I'd like nature sounds for this next part, and so on. So that they can express some of that semantic meaning as well as the strokes in the page. It is very much like that. In the sense that uh, what kind of sounds you want will depend very much on what you are actually drawing. So uh, if you're drawing a portrait, you might want to engage with that person's voice, right? Um, if you... I thought, after we did objects on the table, I thought, very hard. Did we actually uh, ask Kathleen Ladano to work with us just because she was such a great improviser? Yes, 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 three times yes. But afterwards, I thought, however, the kind of objects we had on the table were a bunch of bottles, a bunch of jugs, bowls, Generally, those kind of things that you can make sound by blowing into them. So uh, it was not, not entirely arbitrary. So I think um, this will always have to be an aesthetic decision. And uh, if you're actually making a performance uh, piece rather than just playing with it. Um, but even so, as you will see here when we Klaus is going to demonstrate the, the machine to you. Is, yes, you can pick sounds and uh, program your own sounds, uh, own repertoire of sounds to create whatever um, uh, drawing with sound that you want. Could you, you do that in real time so that, for example, someone that's both an artist and, say, a singer, they can sing a few notes and then draw with those notes? Uh, if that's what you want to do, yes, certainly. Um, what is being a drawer myself? I'm much more interested in my drawing the singer uh, singing the, the drawing, but but it does go that way. So one of the things that you brought up is that very interesting is the idea of feedback. In the sense that when I make noise drawing, I cannot help noise or sound. I cannot help but hear the kind of sound I make. And what I hear will, in fact, influence what I make. It's not quite so obvious when I'm writing, because writing has its own real sort of drive. But when you, when you draw, what you hear will really kind of change of how you're going to draw. So, so feedback is definitely something that we, we have to pay attention to. Any other drawing? Um, any other drawing? Any other questions, please? <laughs> uh. Yes? I want to know when you were doing the dragon, when your teacher was guiding the hand, you, have you already drawn that character a number of times? Did you know exactly what you were going to draw? Uh, no. We set up the camera because, um, again, that was sort of almost a feasibility kind of uh, test, uh, part of the research for the lineage machine. So we set up the camera. I had watched Noriko do the dragon. Um, I had done another version. All the, the oriental characters have several versions, A block uh, style, a cursive style. I had done the cursive style, but I had not done the block, and certainly not that size. I had done my cursive version this size, 
So not that size, working with the whole arm. And, and what we were there, interested there was exactly working with the whole arm rather than the kind of uh, small movement, which uh, also happens. Uh, the teacher actually will make a small character with you too. But uh, this whole arm is something that I'm really interested for the lineage machine. Yes? Uh, in your earlier uh, examples of the sounds coming from the from the drawing, yes. was that those were interpretations by by a musician or or the, the yes. singer yes. interpreting the drawing? Is that yes. Right? So, so um, what uh, happened is I did the drawing with oscillators, and then the drawings get saved and they get played back as an animation. We turned off the sound and played it back and the instrumentalist uh, or the singer or the cellist uh, reinterpreted the drawing. So we have a number of drawings that... Without hearing any sound? Pardon? Just looking at the drawing. Yes. The, the instrumentalist just does the drawing. They weren't listening to any Yes, just the drawing. They, they were reacting just to the drawing. What I also realized is that when we draw, when I draw, I draw very fast. And that in fact, it, was, it caused certain problems for somebody who plays an instrument. The people who are very agile this way were vocalists. Vocalists could, could go as fast as I could because they did not have this intermediary instrument of making sound with something else. They were working with the body the way I was working with my body to, to make the drawing. So that, that was very interesting because talking about the voices of drawing, then I thought, well, the voice of a drawing is really a human voice in the end. Whatever else we're doing now, it, it is a human voice. And if you think about vocalizing, if you see a shape, you know, you can actually vocalize it uh, quite easily. If I make a shape like this, uh, you, you'll feel it in your throat. And sometimes when you hear certain sounds, if you hear a whoop, you know immediately what to do with your hand, right? It's a, there's a, quite a correspondence there. For me, it's an intuition, but uh, I think um, once we finish this research, it'll show that it's more than an intuition. Yes. Have you actually gotten any feedback from, from actual synesthetes, people who have, who have synesthesia? Yeah, um, I actually try to connect with the people at the university who study synesthesia and uh, psychology. Well, uh, they're much, more, this uh, particular university, they're much more interested in color and number uh, kind of connection than uh, shape. And personally, I think shape is one of those things that are so strong, we do not actually think about them. Um, so the ones that are more unusual are the ones of uh, uh, tasting sounds, or um, w which we actually do. We, we think, if you think of uh, uh, this words, language actually tells us a lot about the, um, the fact that we use more than one sense in understanding sound, images, or any kind of perception. We use more than one sense. We taste with our eyes, we, we hear with our eyes, we see with our ears. So if you think of a sound as being sour, I mean, it can make you, you can make a, your mouth pucker, you, and you know exactly what the sour sound is, right? So there is some uh, patternicity to it. It's not sort of arbitrary depending on the individual. Yes. I, and I, th I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, we cannot help it. Our bodies uh, work um, with all the senses we've got. Yes? Uh, did you ever interpret the sound interpretation yourself of your own drawing? Is it? Uh, it's it's backwards. It yes. It comes out of uh, sound in mind. I haven't done it yet. I, uh, I had my nose very much in creating, uh, in going the, from drawing to sound. Yeah. But, uh, but that's exactly, that's exactly the, the next step in the, the new form of the, is taking, going from sound to mark and see what kind of mark you get. I, I'm, I suspect there is quite a consistency. 
uh, we need a, a big statistical uh, population to actually get some meaningful results, you know. Uh, so it's going to be quite interesting. I mean, I'm just one person. We, we need you all to do it, and uh, hundreds of samples to actually be able to, to draw any conclusions. My intuition is that, yes, there is a consistency. Any more questions? Well, uh, I invite you to come up and uh, play. <laughs> uh, and um, Klaus can show you how to change uh, sounds if you want to, to um, do that. And uh, uh, I brought some objects because quite often when people um, are confronted with an empty page, the question is, what shall I draw? So you can, can draw some objects. So uh, please come up. <laughs> 